here to talk to you about climate change, about droughts, and about armed conflict. I'm also here to talk to you about sustainable solutions that can help solve all three of these. You see, as a child, I spent almost every summer with my family in Aleppo, Syria. The last summer there in 2007, I'll never forget. It was exceptionally hot, much hotter than any other year. The water supply was out during days in the month, and the electricity was out during the hottest hours of the day. There was a sense of unease in the air. My relatives were talking about farmers that are moving in from the villages to the outskirts of the city, looking for jobs and food. As it turns out, 2007 marked the beginning of a severe three-year drought, one that was caused and exacerbated by the effects of climate change. For the first time, there is scientific evidence linking that severe drought to the social unrest that eventually led to the Syrian civil war. One of the largest humanitarian crises and armed conflicts of our time. So many people got hurt in the process. My family, that is actually still in Syria. Unfortunately, in 2012, we lost our father-in-law, Mustafa, to the Syrian civil war. Of course, the political situation in Syria is very complex. But the research coming from Columbia and Berkeley universities make complete sense. Water shortages in the Fertile Crescent in Iraq, in Syria, and in Turkey caused animals, caused livestock to die, drove food prices up, sickened children, and caused millions of farmers to move to the outskirts of jam-packed Syrian cities. Mohammed and my family's story is only one of many. The World Bank estimates that by 2050, over 140 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and South Asia will be forced to be climate refugees. Just a bit of a perspective, in the eight years since the beginning of the Syrian civil war, almost six million people have been caused to flee the country. Almost six million people, in addition to that, were also relocated within the country, and almost 400,000 people were killed. Syria isn't the only example that is already unfolding. We see tensions rise between India and Pakistan over water access and, and, and safe and drinking water. This is especially troubling for Pakistan they will lose crucial water access. And at our own southern border, civil unrest and clashes unfold as farmers from El Salvador are seeking safe and affordable water. <clears throat> In honor of Mustafa, I had made it my personal mission to help fight human suffering caused by climate change. It is an urgent mission. As I said, without action, millions of people will be caused refugees by the devastating effects of wildfires, hurricanes, and droughts. In order to help me carry out this mission, I've committed my career to helping build a world that runs on clean energy. This means that in the process, we're going to have to figure out how to go by with a lot less coal and with a lot more wind and solar. This also means that we're gonna have to learn how to deploy renewable energy, not only when it's available, but when we really need it. 
And that's where my job comes into play. Every day I have the privilege to work on solving how to, um, how to deploy more and more solar, quicker, cheaper, at a bigger scale. And I'd like to share with you a couple of insights that I've learned in the process over the years. The first insight is, you won't believe it when I say it, but there is such a thing as too much renewable energy. Uh, what's happening on the California grid right now is the solar penetration is considered quite high at only 30 to 40 percent. What we're seeing in the middle of the day as the solar floods the electricity market, there is a suppression in, 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 in demand, and that demand spikes in the evening when, when we really need the energy. That's where batteries can really help. My second insight is kind of driving home the idea of California as a pioneer. Just as California was one of the first states to adapt the renewable portfolio standard, it's now working hard on legislation that can help link all of our solar to batteries. This kind of action on behalf of states is crucial for us to get to 100% clean energy. The third insight, and my favorite, is just as of recently, it turns out that building new renewable and storage power plants is cheaper than building new gas and coal. This is primarily due to the drastic reduction in costs of solar and batteries over the past 10 years. This reduction in cost is going to continue going over the next 50 years. What this means is just by the numbers alone, it shouldn't make any economic sense for us to invest into new coal and gas. But that's my story. And I realize that not everyone has the privilege or opportunity to work in solar, but that we're all here because we're passionate about finding solutions to problems in a creative way. So what can you do? Uh, what can I leave you behind with? I think a lot of my ideas will resonate with what Lisa Ann said. But remember to consume wisely. Primarily, just remember the power of your wallet. Wield it whenever you can. Buy products and from companies that support the causes that you believe in. Also, Maybe change your behavior a little bit. Maybe reduce and use more than you recycle. Drive electric, fly less, eat less beef. Or maybe just give the gift of, of trees this holiday season to your family and friends. Secondly, don't forget to vote. Get political. This is especially important this election season. But please also remember to support bills and legislation that fights for the causes that we believe in. Remember that we create a movement by supporting leaders. And we support leaders by giving them a platform. But now more than ever, it's also important to remember to keep an open mind and not to get too political. We need to remember to reach out and cultivate allies on both sides of the aisle. Now, these are just a few ideas, and I'm sure you have so many of your own. And before I conclude, I wanted to leave you with a little positive thought. I'm not here to instill climate change guilt or anxiety. I do think there is hope. More and more academics, inventors, political and business leaders are turning to looking for ways to fix the intergenerational debt of the negative externalities of carbon emissions and climate change. Just a couple of days ago, the IMF has officially endorsed the Carbon Fee and Dividend Act and proposed a tenfold increase in the price of carbon. There is hope. All we have to do, like Lisa Ann said, is stop, breathe, think, connect like we do today, and act. We just have to Keep a sustainable pace going. It's going to be the sum of small actions that will make the bigger difference. 
thank you in helping me potentially prevent another Syrian civil war from happening.